Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our 21st session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Anbiya. And alhamdulillah we've reached verse number 101 and inshallah we'll pick up our discussion uh, there. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين سبقت لهم من الحسن أولئك عنها مبعدون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 101 He says surely those from whom what is most beautiful has already gone forth from us they shall be kept far away from it. This verse is a clarification of verse number 98 that we've already covered. If you recall in ayah number 98, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّكُمْ وَمَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ حَصَبُ جَهَنَّمِ That you and what you worship, your false gods, that which you worship other than God will be the fuel of the hellfire. So this, this ayah that we're looking at, ayah number 101, refers to these objects of worship who were falsely worshipped, but did not participate in this false worship, such as Jesus السلام, such as the angels. So here... There is an exception that you and those who you worship will be the fuel of the hellfire except those who, except surely those from whom what is most beautiful has already gone forth from us. So, and, and this is why we mentioned in our last, uh, I think it was in our last session where when that ayah was revealed, when that verse was revealed, stating that the objects of worship, those false gods that were taken by people, will be thrown into the hellfire. So what? So naturally, people came forward and said that does that mean that that Jesus will, will also be thrown in the hellfire because he was also taken by many as a deity. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surely those from whom what is most beautiful has already gone forth from us, they shall be kept far from it. Now, what is the meaning of, uh, of al-husna? That what is most beautiful has already been, has already gone forth from us. Now, as I mentioned, this ayah refers to those objects of worship, that some of them will not be punished because they did not participate in rallying people and recruiting people for their worship, like Jesus, like the angels. However, this ayah can also be understood in a more general sense, that those who will be protected from the hellfire are those who sabaqat lahum min al-husna meaning that these are the people who who will go to paradise and who essentially built paradise through their own actions through the purity of their hearts if you recall brothers and sisters we mentioned in some of our previous sessions that that the source the real source of hellfire is the human soul. They are the dark souls of the corrupt and the wicked. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu qū anfusakum wa ahlīkum wa ahlīkum nāran wa qūduha an-nās wal hijāra. Protect yourselves and your family members from a fire whose fuel is people. Wa qūduha an-nās. So the souls of people are the fuel of hellfire. Conversely, paradise, the source of paradise, is also, to a certain extent, 
the human soul. So Jahannam in many ways is the manifestation of the corrupt souls and paradise is the materialization, it's the projections of those pure immaculate souls. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that إِنَّ الَّذِينَ سَبَقَتْ لَهُمْ مِنَّ الْحُسْنَ Surely those from whom, for whom what is most beautiful has already gone forth from us. Meaning that paradise is not something that is simply promised. It is a current reality. So it's not that Paradise is something that will be created in the future. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran, for example, verse number 133, he says, إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن وَجَنَّةٍ وَالْأَرْضِ Hasten, Allah says, hasten towards the mercy of your Lord, the forgiveness of your Lord, and hasten towards a paradise that is as vast as the heavens and the earth. That has been prepared. Uiddat is a past tense verb. It has been prepared for the God fearing, for the pious. So paradise is under construction at the moment. It's not something that is going to be created in the future. We, at every moment, we are building paradise. That the, the source, the real source of paradise is, is the human soul. Now, so this is one aspect of the verse. That there are those who will be punished, who will taste divine chastisement, those who actively worshipped false deities, those objects of worship that participated in recruiting people, that, that actively recruited people to worship them, with the exception of Isa and the, the angels. Secondly, so this ayah indicates that this, this beautiful reward is already there. It's already been created. It has been prepared for the righteous. Secondly, not only will these individuals enter paradise, Allah says that they shall ulaika anha mubadun. They will be kept far away from it. It meaning the hellfire. And mubadun is a a passive participle it's it's ism maf'ul and that means that they are they are not moving away from the hellfire they are moved they are distanced from the hellfire meaning that it is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has distanced them from the hellfire that he is the one who has taken it taken it upon himself to remove them and to keep them far away from the environment from the atmosphere of the hellfire. Now in ayah number 102, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further elaborates on how far they will be taken away from, from the hellfire. You know, sometimes you, you, may, you may live in a very pleasant place, but you might have a neighbor who is, who is creating a lot of uh, noise who's creating a disturbance. So even if you are comfortable in your house, if you are in close proximity to someone who is miserable, to someone who creates a disturbance, it's also going to affect you. So there is a huge distance between Ahlul Jannah and Ahlul Nar. And then Allah, so Allah says in ayah number 102 about the inhabitants of paradise, لا يسمعون حسيسها وهم في مشتهت أنفسهم خالدون. They hear not the slightest sound thereof. 
while they abide in that which their souls desire eternally. The word hasis, it has, it has many meanings. You know, the word hasis is sometimes used to describe a whisper. In, in dua and nudba, for example, when we address the 12th Imam, we say, Azizun alayya an ara al khalqa wa la tura. That it's, it's so difficult for me that I get to see all creation. I get to see all people. I get to see everything, but I don't get to see you. And not only do we complain that we don't see our Imam, we say, وَلَا أَسْمَعُ لَكَ حَسِيسًا وَلَا نَجْوَى That, O oh, Imam, we complain to the 12th Imam about this, this state of separation. That we, we, it's difficult that we don't see you. That we, we get to see everything, but we don't get to see you. And we don't even get to hear a whisper from him. وَلَا أَسْمَعُ لَكَ حَسِيسًا وَلَا نَجْوَى We don't hear the slightest sound from you or a whisper. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He speaks about how far He has distanced the inhabitants of paradise from the hellfire, He says that they will not hear the slightest sound, the slightest crackling from Jahannam. Because we human beings are affected by what we hear. Now you can imagine how much of an effect sounds have on our psychology, our psyche. That even in paradise, if you were to hear the crackling of Jahannam, it would, it would have a negative impact on you. It would decrease your enjoyment. In Surah an naba Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 35, again speaking about this idea that the people of paradise will not hear anything that will disturb them. The people of Jannah, the people of paradise, they will not hear any idle talk, meaning that they will not hear anything that is useless. Everything that they hear in paradise has value. It's something that is positive. It's something that is productive. It's something that brings joy and delight to their hearts. They will not hear anything that is neutral, that is idle, that is lagu, that is senseless. Wala kithaba, and they will not hear anything that is false. No lies, nothing that is false will reach their ears. So, لا يسمعون حسيسها They will not hear the slightest sound from it. وَهُمْ فِي مَشْتَهَتْ أَنفُسُهُمْ خَالِدُونَ And they will abide in that which their souls desire eternally. The word that's used here, وَهُمْ فِي You know, the word فِي means to be in something. And the idea here is that the people of paradise, the residents of paradise, they will be completely immersed in whatever their souls desire for all of eternity. Meaning that, you know, it's, it's, it's like they are drowning. They are being showered by Allah's blessings and His favors. And they will they will be immersed in whatever they desire. Not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, not for a year, not for a million years. For all of eternity. And what they will desire. Now you may, some people ask, you know, what if someone desires to do something that is reprehensible? You know, brothers and sisters, before people enter paradise their hearts are purified. You know, one of the functions, one of the purposes of the Day of Judgment and the different stations of the Day of Judgment and crossing the Sirat, all of these stations on Yom Al-Qiyamah, they serve as a purification for the soul. 
So when people finally cross the Sirat, the final thing that they will do before they enter Jannah is they will drink from the pool of Kawthar. Now why is it that we drink from the pool of Kawthar? Because the pool of Kawthar will remove any final traces of ignorance, of hatred, of greed, of hubbu dunya, whatever it may be. All, any remaining vice will be cleansed. And therefore, the people who are entering paradise will have purified hearts and hearts that are purified would never desire anything that is vile. They would never desire anything that is repugnant or reprehensible. Now the question here is, because in paradise there is a spiritual dimension and there is a material dimension. There are material blessings in paradise and there are physical pleasures in paradise. Now, people will be able to indulge in both. They'll be able to enjoy the physical pleasures and they'll be able to enjoy the spiritual pleasures. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the the rewards, the pleasures of paradise in Surah at tawbah ayah number 72, and we've, we've covered this uh, this ayah in our previous uh, in the discussion on the tafsir of Surah At-Tawbah. Allah says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Allah has promised the believing men and the believing women جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِ مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَا He has promised them gardens through which rivers flow, gardens and rivers. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا they will, they will live in it eternally. وَمَسَاكِنَ طَيِّبَةً Not only will they be given gardens and rivers, they will have their own property, meaning they will have their own residence, they will have their own palaces, they will have their own mansions. And these are مَسَاكِنَ طَيِّبَةً Meaning that they will be, these are places that give them peace. You know, sometimes someone might live in a palace, but they're not at peace. They don't feel that that inner uh, tranquility, that internal tranquility, that, that serenity. But Allah says, these people, the people of Jannah, they will have masakina tayyiba, these good dwellings. They give them that sense of peace and calm. Fi jannati adn wa min Allahi akbar. So Allah lists material blessings he lists about three or four material blessings and then he mentions one spiritual blessing which is the pleasure of Allah and the pleasure of God is greater than all of these things now in Jannah depending on a person's spiritual rank some people are more inclined towards the physical pleasures because not everyone in paradise is the same. Not every soul in, the, in, in paradise is the same. There are some souls that are more inclined to the spiritual gifts, the spiritual enjoyments. And therefore they, they will indulge more in the spiritual aspects of paradise. While those who are a bit more who are lower in their spiritual rank, they, they will enjoy the spiritual pleasures, but not to the extent of those who occupy the higher stations of paradise. لا يسمعون حسيسها They shall not hear the slightest sound from it, from the hellfire. وهم في نشتهت أنفسهم خالدون Now, there is another ayah in the Quran, in Surah Qaf, Ayah number 35, where Allah says, not only will people in paradise have what they desire, Allah says, لهم, لهم ما يشاؤون فيها. They will have in it, in Jannah, in paradise, whatever they desire. And then Allah says, وَلَدَيْنَا مزيد. And with us is something that is even more. And the idea here is that people will have whatever they desire and more. Meaning that there are things, because you can only desire something that you can comprehend. 
You can only desire, you know, to desire something, you have to first comprehend it. Allah in Surah Qaf, ayah number 35, He says that you will have whatever you can comprehend, whatever you can, whatever you desire, and you will also be given things that you cannot even comprehend. وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيد And with us is, is even more. Ayah number 103. لا يحزنهم الفزع الأكبر وتتلقاهم الملائكة هذا يومكم الذي كنتم تعدون. The greatest terror will not grieve them, and the angels will receive them. This is your day, which you were promised. Now. What is the meaning of the greatest terror? لا يحزنهم الفزع والأكبر The greatest terror will not grieve them. There is a, a discussion among the, the Mufassireen about what is meant by this, uh, this uh, الفزع والأكبر The greatest terror. Now some some believe that this is a reference to the the first blowing of the trumpet. You know that in the Quran we have this concept of النفخ في الصور, blowing in the trumpet, and this is going to happen twice. That the angel Israfil, this mighty angel, will blow into the trumpet, and of course this is figurative language. That this is an indication that there will be a type of sound blast, some cataclysmic event that will cause the entire universe to break down, it will, it will wipe out and destroy the cosmos as we know it. Some say that this is what is meant. And, and for example, if you look at Surah An Naml, Surah 27, ayah number 87, the word fazi'a, fafazi'a is used. The same word is, is used. وَيَوْمَ يُنْفَخُ فصول. On the day that the trumpet is blown, فَفَزِعَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Everyone in the heavens and everyone on earth, meaning all sentient beings, will be terrified, they will be stunned, Illa man sha Allah, except those whom God wills. Wa kullun atawhu dakhirin. So some commentators they say that when the universe, when the universe collapses, when Israfil blows into the trumpet, and everything in the universe perish, perishes, and this includes people in dunya and in people in barzakh, that the the mu'minin they will they will not be in a state of terror when when this worldly life when this phase of existence comes to an end other scholars say that no this this faza al faza al akbar refers to the day of judgment it refers to the the blowing of the second trumpet whereby everything will return to life. And there's a dua from Imam Zain al-Abidin which supports this uh, this idea, which supports this interpretation. Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam, I think this is the dua that he used to recite on Mondays. He says, وَأَعُوذُ, وأعوذ بِكَ مِنْ يَوْمٍ أوله فزع وأوسطه جزع وآخره وجع I seek refuge with you from a day whose beginning is terror and whose middle is you know uh, anxiety or, or grief and whose end is pain so the Imam says the day of judgment is a day in which the beginning of it is Fazak. It's, it's terrifying. Now why is it terrifying? The Quran gives us 
uh, descriptions of people when they come out of their graves. You know, it seems that the initial phase, the initial, the beginning of the Day of Judgment is characterized by this, this state of disorientation. For example, Allah in Surah Al-Qari'ah, in Surah 101, Ayah number 4, Allah says, يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَدْفُوثِ the day when people will be like scattered moths. When people come out of their graves, and we have a hadith about this, people will rise up from their graves, from the places that they were buried on earth. And people will be terrified. You know, even Allah in, in Surah Al-Hajj, He says, وَتَرَى النَّاسَ السُّكَارَ وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارَ you will see people intoxicated, but they're not intoxicated. But the, the, when, you know, they are intoxicated with fear. They're terrified. So Allah, going back to the, the verse of Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah says, لا يحزنهم الفزع الأكبر That they will not, the greatest terror, that initial disorientation that people will fear, feel the mu'mineen, those who are paradise bound, they will be consoled at that moment. They will be comforted. And this is mentioned in Surah Fussilat, Surah 41, verses 30 to 31. Inna rabbun Allah, those who say that Allah is our Lord. Thummastaqamu, and they they become upright. Meaning they live in accordance with that belief. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَ The angels descend upon them. Saying to them what? أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا Do not fear and do not grieve. وَأَبْشُرُ بِالْجَنَّةِ So this is a bashara. This is a glad tiding that is given to them when they come out of their graves. When most people are in a state of terror. They see that you know they've come out of their graves. The day of judgment is about to begin. People are confused. They're disoriented. These angels, who act as administrators of the day of judgment, Malaika have a major role to play on that day. They will comfort these believers and give them the glad tidings of paradise, التي كنتم توعدون the paradise that you were promised, and then the angels will say to them. نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا We were your guardians. We were your protectors in dunya. وَفِي yeah. الْآخِرَةِ And we're all, we, we are also your protectors, your guardians, your intimate friends in the hereafter. Meaning that we're also with you. So going back to the verse, لَا يَحْزُنُهُمُ الْفَزَعُ الْأَكْبَرِ the greatest terror will not grieve them. So either the greatest terror means that when everything perishes, they will not grieve, that this will be, it will not be a terrifying moment for them. They will be protected. Or it means that they will be protected. They will not, the greatest terror will not grieve them, meaning the day of judgment will not be a day of grief for them. Why will it not be a grief, day of grief for them? Because وَتَتَلَقَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ The angels will receive them. You know, imagine how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors the believers. That the angels will receive them. Not one angels, scores of angels. Waves of angels will receive them. And what do the angels say? What do the malaika say to them? To comfort them. You know, everybody is in a state of fear. Everyone is petrified. They're terrified. The malaika say to the mu'mineen, هَذَا يَوْمُكُمُ الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ This is your day. The day that you were promised. You know, you know how sometimes, you know, if it's your birthday, they say, this is your day. This is your big day. If you get, you know, uh, if you get married, people typically say what? Well, this is your day. This day is all about you. 
You are the center of attention. This day is about celebrating you. It's about celebrating your spouse. Celebrating your birthday. This is your day. The Malaika, they say the same thing to the believers. That this is your day. The day of Qiyamah, the day of judgment, is not a day that you should be afraid of. Don't grieve. Don't worry. You were persecuted. You suffered in dunya. You were marginalized. You were silenced. You were oppressed. The angels say what now? This is your day. This is the day in which you are going to be honored. This is the day where you will be recognized, where you will be elevated. This is a day where your life will be celebrated. What you did in your life will be celebrated. And you can imagine what a distinct honor this is. That even before the mu'minin enter paradise, they're being saluted by the angels. They're being received by the malaika. They're being comforted by them. And then ultimately they are also escorted into paradise. Ayah number 104. يَوْمَ نَطْوِ السَّمَاءَ كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُ وَعْدًا عَلَيْنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا فَاعِلِينَ That day we shall roll up the sky like the rolling of scrolls for writings. As we began the first creation, so we shall bring it back, a promise binding upon us, surely we shall do it. Now, before the day of judgment, so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about what is, what is inevitable before that day. And what is inevitable is the complete annihilation of creation. We mentioned that before the day of judgment, there is, there is the blowing of the first trumpet, whereby all sentient beings will perish, angels will perish, human beings will perish, those who are in dunya will perish, those who are in barzakh will perish, and then the entire universe is destroyed. It's rolled up. Now, and, and if and you find in the Quran, there are many verses in the Quran where Allah speaks about the this this cosmic breakdown that the entire universe collapses. In the in the shamsu when the sky when the sun becomes dim, it becomes extinguished. When the nujum kedarat, when the stars become dim, when the skies are rent asunder. Now the question is, why, why does this have to happen before the Day of Judgment? Why can't, you know, Israfil just blow the whistle and that's it? Now we're in the Akhirah, Day of Judgment. Why does this destruction have to take place? Why does creation have to be annihilated as a precursor to the Day of Judgment? Now, it seems that the reason that this has to happen. That first, the universe has to be destroyed, and then the trumpet is blown again, and then the Akhirah begins. So it seems that this, the destruction of the temporal world, is to facilitate the evolution of the universe into a new phase of existence. What, so what, what happens between the blowing of the first trumpet and the blowing of the second, and we don't know what the time interval is between the two, the two trumpets, the blowing of the two trumpets. The first nafkha, everything perishes. The universe collapses. The second nafkha, everything comes back to life. What happens in between is fascinating. 
What happens in between is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restructures the universe. There is a transformation that takes place. The earth, the solar system, the universe as we know it is transformed. Their structure, their properties are changed, they're altered. And this is mentioned in, and this is all done to prepare for the hereafter. Because the hereafter is, is another world. It's a world that has different laws. So the, the laws that govern dunya and that govern this universe that we see are different from the laws that will govern the hereafter. So there is this restructuring that has to take place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah Ibrahim, surah 14, ayah number 48, he mentions this. يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضُ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ On the day when the earth will be changed into a different earth and the heavens. So for example, you'll see water on the earth, but it the property the properties of that water water differs from the water in dunya that it's it's more enhanced the properties of everything has become enhanced so there are a few things that change one of them is that the 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 entire universe is restructured there are new natural laws that have been created which govern alam al akhirah which govern the day of judgment which govern paradise and hellfire Secondly, what happens during the blow between these intervals is that Allah gives everything the ability to perceive, understand, and communicate. So the earth now is not able to speak to us, but on, but in the akhirah, it is given this ability. Its ability is enhanced. That's why Allah says, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا يَوْمَ إِذِنْ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا The earth is different because the earth now has the ability to communicate. In dunya, it doesn't have the ability to communicate. So this is what, what I mean when, we, when I say that the, the earth, the universe, creation is altered. It's restructured. Even the laws of cause and effect. So the law of cause and effect will still exist. But the difference is that in dunya, the laws of cause and effect are more visible than the hand of God. You know, for most people, they're blinded by the, chain, the chains of causes and effects. And the hand of God, of course, I'm, I'm going to say the hand of God figuratively, is something that is, is behind it. But in the Akhirah, the hand of God is more visible and is more obvious than the chain of cause and effect. That's why the Day of Judgment is called Maliki Yawm You know, in Surah Al-Fatiha, we say Maliki Yawm He's the master of the Day of Judgment. But he's, all, he's the master of dunya. Why, does, why do we say he's the master of the Day of Judgment? In dunya, only the mu'mineen were able to see the hand of God behind the chain of cause and effect. Whereas in, in the hereafter, cause and effect becomes something that is in the background. What is more obvious is that God is in full control. يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضِ غَيْرَ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ and then Allah says at the end of the ayah, "Kama bada'na awwal khalqin nu'idu." As we began the first creation, we shall bring it back. Now, some say that this refers to the universe, that the same Lord who created the laws that govern. This earthly existence, he's also able to bring it back with a new set of laws. That it's it's as easy as introducing new laws. 
other mufassirin, they say, no, this is speaking specifically about the human being. Our first creation refers to our birth. We came into this world naked, helpless, disoriented, and we shall bring them back in the same way. Meaning that when we come out of our graves, you know, people are naked, they're helpless, and they're disoriented. So there is, there is a repeat. So, you know, subhanAllah, the, when we come out of the wombs of our mothers, you know, we're helpless, we're naked, we're crying, we're disoriented. So we come, we all came out of the wombs of our mothers, but everyone else, you know, on the day of judgment, we will come out of what? Not a womb. We will come out of the earth. The earth, will be our new womb. And we will come out of it in the same way that a baby comes out of the womb, completely bewildered by this new mysterious world, naked, confused, helpless, disoriented. كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُ وَعْدًا عَلَيْنَا Allah says, this is a, a promise binding upon us. Now it's not binding because someone imposed it on Allah. Allah has imposed this on Himself because He's just. His justice necessitates that there is life after death, that there is a world, there is a day when people will be held accountable. Because in this life, there are many who escape justice. They commit mass murder, they die, and that's it. Their victims never taste justice. They're never brought to account. So Allah says that this is, so we, this is a promise binding upon us. And indeed we shall do it. Because Allah's perfection, His justice, His wisdom, His mercy necessitates that He does this. So it's not that He's being compelled, but His own perfection, His own essence makes it binding upon himself. Ayah number 105 وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ And we have indeed written in the Psalms وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ and we have indeed written in the Psalms after the reminder that my servants shall inherit the earth, that my righteous servants shall inherit the earth. Now again, Allah's justice will be manifested on the day of judgment, but His justice will also be manifested at the end of times. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not even allow this temporal world to end without ensuring that truth triumphs over falsehood. So as a prelude to the day of judgment, truth will overcome falsehood in this life. Justice will prevail over injustice. And Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِكَ We have indeed written in the Psalms after the reminder. So there are two scriptures that are mentioned here. And this is a reference to the Savior, to uh, the, the 12th Imam. It's, and it, this is definitely one of the, the highest applications of this ayah. Is that it's a reference to this idea that the that the end, the end of times, that the righteous will take control of the world. They will assume political power. Now why is it that out of all of the scriptures that Allah has revealed, Suhuf Ibrahim, Wa Musa, the Injil, so many scriptures have been revealed. Why is it that these two scriptures are mentioned? 
And this is a an ayah that is related to the Mahdi, from, related to the 12th Imam, Ajallah Ta'ala Fawr. So why these two books? Why is it that the Psalms of David is mentioned? We have indeed written in the Psalms after the reminder, meaning the Torah, because the Psalms of David came after the Torah, because Dawood, chronologically, he, he came after Musa. So why is it that these two books are mentioned? So the Mufassirin of the Qur'an, the commentators, they say that Dawood, the book of Dawood is mentioned specifically because David, because Dawood salam, was a prophet of God who was able to establish a just government. So this idea of a just government is not something that is foreign. That Imam al-Mahdi will establish what Dawood established but on a larger scale. A just government. Taurat is also mentioned. So the, the idea of Imam al-Mahdi you just think about how significant this is. How central this is in Islamic thought. You know we speak about ahadith mentioning the 12th Imam. It's not just ahadith. And in fact you know if you count all of the ahadith relating to Imam al-Mahdi in Sunni and Hadith literature, there are more ahadith about Imam al-Mahdi than any other subject. We have more ahadith about the Mahdi than we have about Salah, that, than we have about Tawheed, than we have about Qiyamah, than we have about Death or Hajj. The most emphasized topic at least numerically, among all other subjects is the 12th Imam. It's the Mahdi. So it's not just a hadith, even if you, I mean, according to this ayah, the, the, the appearance of a savior at the end of times was so critical and so central to the teachings of all prophets it was mentioned in the Psalms of David. It was mentioned in the Torah. So it's not just the fact that Rasulullah is mentioned in the Injil, in the Torah, in the Zabur. Imam al-Mahdi is also mentioned that, he, that him and his companions will inherit the earth by the will of God. So he's meant, so this concept is mentioned in the Zabur, the Psalms of David. Presumably because David was a just king was able to establish the law of God. The Torah is mentioned. And if you look at the story of, of Musa, it's amazing because Musa السلام, is seen as a liberator. He liberated Bani Israel from the tyranny of Fir'aun. Imam al-Mahdi will do the same, but on a larger scale. Musa liberated one group, Bani Israel. Imam al-Mahdi will liberate all people from the Fir'auns of the time. So, you know, Musa had to deal with one Pharaoh. Believe me, Imam Sahib al-Zaman, he's going to have to deal with dozens, tens of them. So, the Mufassirin, they say, this is the secret behind the mentioning of Zabur and the Torah. And if you look at this idea of inheriting, Allah says that my righteous servants shall inherit the earth. Now if you think about inheritance, what you inherit is not something that you really had to work for. Right? So for example, if you have a wealthy uncle and you're the only, and you're the nearest of kin, you're the only relative, you receive everything, you receive the, the, the benefits of all that this person, of all of the efforts of your uncle. Your uncle worked and struggled, he dies and it's transferred to you with no effort. 
Now, you know, sometimes we think, you know, how is this going to happen? Where Imam al Mahdi is going to take control? It seems to be something daunting. Like, it's like achieving the impossible. If you look at the story of Musa, think about Fir'aun. Fir'aun was the head, he was, he was the head of a superpower, and that superpower was Egypt. This massive civilization, and you have Musa, who was a shepherd. You know, he was very, you know, raggedy clothes. He, he doesn't, you know, he's a shepherd with, with this group, Bani Israel, who are these downtrodden people, these slaves, who have no money, who have no position in society. They're second, third class citizens. And look at how everything changes. If you go to Surah al dukhan Surah 44, verses 23 to 28, Allah says, فَأَسْرِ بِعِبَادِي لَيْلًا إِنَّكُمْ مُتَّبَعُونَ O Musa, take my servants out of Egypt at night because you will be pursued. So they follow Musa to the Red Sea. And what happens? Allah, he's summarizing. They drown in the Red Sea. And then Allah says, and look at what Allah says. كَمْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ جَنَّاتٍ وَعْيُونَ Fir'aun drowns, his whole army drowns, his whole, his whole administration perishes. And all of those years that Fir'aun was building the pyramids, he was building Egypt, they left behind all of those gardens and all of those streams. وَزُرُوعٍ وَمَقَامٍ كَرِيمٍ وَزُرُوعٍ وَمَقَامٍ كَرِيمٍ They left all of those orchards and those palaces. And they left all of those blessings and bounties. And then what did Allah do? Allah says we made others inherit. So who did all the hard work? Fir'aun built and put so much effort and spent so much money. Allah took him, threw him in the Red Sea. He drowned. And others took over. They had a country that was already built. There was infrastructure. Allah says it's as easy as that. I remove them and I, I allow you to benefit from all of the effort that they put in. So if you go to this verse, many of these, these superpowers that are building and what's going to happen is that Imam al-Mahdi is simply going to take over. In the same way that Allah removed Fir'aun and, you know, they left behind, you know, these palaces and all of the, the, this infrastructure, the buildings and this massive civilization. Allah says, I made others inherit it. I transferred it to others because of their rebelliousness. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, our fifth Imam, when he was asked about this ayah, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدَ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ He says, هُمْ أَصْحَابُ الْمَهْدِي That these, this ayah is a reference to the companions of Imam al-Mahdi في آخر الزمان. Now, we need to make a distinction here between Ashabu al-Mahdi and Ansar al-Mahdi. So Imam al-Mahdi, of course, is not able to, you know, govern and rule over the entire world. He, have, he of course, needs help. You know, in, the, in the same way, Amir al-Mu'mineen needed to appoint governors to uh, to run his his government. Imam al-Mahdi is going to have a, a, a global government and he, al he also has to appoint political leaders to govern the different regions of his global government. The Ashab, the 313 that you and I are familiar with, their role is what? Their role is not to just give lectures from the mimba. 
Their role is to govern. They will be the governors and the rulers in the imam's administration. Now you may, and this is the reason why, one of the reasons why Imam Sahib al-Zaman has not reappeared. Because what Imam al-Mahdi needs from you and I is different from what Imam al Hussein needed from his companions. Imam al Hussein needed people to lay down their lives. I think that today there are millions, tens of millions of Shias who would give their lives for Imam al-Mahdi without even a second thought. If that's the case, why doesn't the Imam reappear? I can, I am certain there are places around the world there are Shias, Mu'mineen, that they are willing to die for Imam al-Mahdi. Millions, not thousands, millions. So the question is, if the Imam has so many people who have this zeal and this love for him, why doesn't he reappear? It's because the Imam doesn't need people to give their lives. What he needs more than that, he needs people who are just, who if he puts them in a position of power, they will be fair. They will not abuse their power. They will not steal. And how many people are like that? Where if you give them political power, they will maintain their morals. Where if the imam puts you in charge of the Islamic treasury, you're not going to pocket the money, you're not going to favor your family members, you're not, you're not going to be corrupt, you're going to be fair, you're going to be just. And this is, this is one of the reasons why Imam al-Mahdi has not reappeared. Because there are many religious people, but how many religious people also have management skills? There are many people who pray and fast, who can recite Quran, but how many believers have the combination of spirituality and management skills and leadership skills and who can govern justly? Imam needs 313 mu'mineen who are also street smart, who have leadership and who have management skills and who can rule and act as governors in his, his administration. It's not easy, brothers and sisters, to govern people. It's not easy to be a, a just political leader and take care of people's needs and establish social justice and not be swayed by lobbyist groups and not be tempted by bribes. It's not easy. And this is, so we'll, we'll conclude uh, with that, uh, with that I inshallah, we'll pick up our discussion. Next week, we'll say Allah on a Muhammad in Wahadi of Bahirin. Allah, Sali Allah, Muhammad, Wali Muhammad, Jeffrey. Salam, Sheikh. Alaikum, Salam, Wahadi. You just mentioned that uh, you will talk about uh, two uh, groups of people, Ashab of Imam and Ansar. I think we, you just uh, completed on, about the Ashab. Can you just throw some light on Ansar also so that yes. he may feel a little better? So, so the Ashab have been defined in number. The Ashab are 313 and they represent the, the inner circle of the Imam. You know, so for example, the equivalent of the Ashab would be like someone like Malik al Ashtar during the time of Imam Ali. These are the people who were active members of his uh, his administration. So they're the inner circle that make up his government. The Ansar, the supporters of the Imam, will be in the tens of thousands, if not in the millions. And these are people that don't, they're not a part of the Imam's government, but they support the Imam's mission, meaning they don't oppose him. They support him and they work, they work with him on the grass, on the grassroots level. Meaning they're, you know, community organizers, they're, they're faithful people in their communities. They believe in the Imam's vision, they support the Imam's vision, they help in whatever way that they can. If the Imam asks them to do something, they will fulfill it. But they don't have the skill set of the Ashab. So, you know, you, so being 
one of the ansar of the imam means that you have to understand his mission statement and you have to know how you are able to fit into that mission statement. How you, with your own skill set, can move his, uh, his mission forward. So the Ansar are basically the helpers, those who help the Imam achieve his goal, which is to establish global justice, but not in an, in an official capacity. So the Ashab will have an official capacity in his government, while the Ansar will be his helpers, his supporters. You know, in the same way, you know, if you look at the candidates that we have today, you have people, you know, if you think of a, of a presidential candidate, you have someone who's running for president, and then you, you have people who are officially a part of the campaign. And then you have volunteers who who volunteer and they make phone calls to recruit support. That Those are the Ansab. Whereas the, the Ashab are, they're the part, they're the, uh, the part of the, uh, a part of the actual, uh, government. They're the, they're the inner circle. So if we're not among the Ansar, then at the very least we pray to be among, if we're not among the Ashab, we pray to at least be among the Ansar. Among, uh, 313 Ashab, I read in one of the book of uh, Hadith, maybe uh, it was a book called Itmam al Hujjah, mm. in that, that uh, there will be about 40 souls still women as hard. I've heard, I've, I've heard of that Hadith. So some say that there will, out of the 313, there will be 40 women. What's, what's known for sure is that, uh, the majority of them, there's a Hadith from Imam Ali where he says, that the majority of the 313 will be youth. And that is, that I think is very fascinating because, you know, the Imam alayhi salam, you know, usually you think government is, you know, for, for the elders, whereas the Imam will have many young people who will be a part of, uh, of his government. So we have a hadith that mentioned that 40 of the 313 will be, will be women. And uh, the majority of them will be will be youth. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Sheikh. I just have to uh, give a comment on this um, ayat. What I had, no, Yomanat was sama tatayis sijin. Yes. A few months uh, ago. A few months back, I went and attended uh, Michel Taku, the 21st century scientist. He had come to Seattle to launch his book. I don't remember his book. And then uh, he was describing about the cosmic breakdown of this entire universe, how the universe is going to fall apart. And uh, she had each and every, uh, this, which he was describing, the end time, how this world is going to crumble and come to an end, with exactly the way Quran describes mm. everything, right oh, from yeah. oceans to uh, sun to everything. I was, uh, uh, I was all struck, and I was sitting in the hall. I didn't know what to say, but uh, after coming home, uh, I was feeling very sorry about not going and, you know, opening the Qur'an in front of him and showing the eyes, this is what uh, the Qur'an says, because I, I <laughs> you know, I was totally uh, awestruck and I didn't know how to react. Oh, yes, I think that so that well. was uh, really, really good. Exactly word to word. If you can, if you can send me a, so this is a, a book that he wrote on this topic? He has come to launch his book and in that Thank you. If, I, I can look it up. Yeah, if you can yeah. look it up and send me the name of the book, I'd be interested in looking at it because I suspect that I mean, if if you look at Ayah one hundred four, where Allah says, "Yo manat was sama tatayis sijlin kutub," the day we shall roll up the yes. sky like the rolling of scrolls for writing. You know, this could be a reference, and Allah knows best. We would have to consult with you know uh, with a scientist, with an astrophysicist. 
it could be a reference to this idea of uh, of a uh, of a black hole. You know, the, the way that things are uh, folded and kind of sucked in. So uh, I, I would be interested in, in in seeing what what science says about how the universe will will come to an end. That uh, you know, will it uh, will there be a type of rolling up? You know, a type of space time curvature um, a black hole we would have yeah. to we'd have to look at uh, what the science says but i I'm sure that it's uh, I mean, just like it always does the Quran you know science always ends up confirming uh, the Quranic descriptions of creation as well as the the destruction of the universe in some sense. the way he described she every eye of uh, the day of Qiyam, it was Beautiful, uh, you know, and I was only interested in taking a picture with him after the session. <laughs> then I came home and I regretted. Oh, wish I had opened the eyes of the Quran and show. You know, may, 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 maybe if if you can get a hold of his email, I, I would, if I were you, I would email him. You know, uh, yes. some of the verses. Just be like, you know, these verses of the Quran came to mind when you were making your presentation. I'd love to hear your yes. thoughts. Inshallah, inshallah. Yes. And the book he wrote was called The Future of Humanity. Future of Humanity. Okay, I'll definitely. I'll write that down. Ahsensu. Any other questions or comments? Uh, do we have any indication of how much time will pass between the time when Imam Mehdi returns and the Day of Judgment? The, the first trumpet blowing? Between. Uh, between the between Imam al Mahdi and the uh, the first trumpet, right. So how how long will this uh, just government? We, we be don't asked? we don't have we have conflicting reports. You know, some have said seventy, some have said you know something in the in the range of hundreds of years. We uh, we don't know, but what we do know is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi is known. In the ahadith, as the, the prophet of Akhir Zaman. So, for example, if you look at all the prophets, and let's say, for example, that Adam lived, you know, let's let's say eight thousand years ago, or ten thousand years ago. So, so think about this. So, if Adam lived ten thousand years ago, and Akhir zaman basically means the time right before the Day of Judgment. And the Prophet is the Prophet of the end of times. For it to make sense, for the Prophet to be called the Prophet of the end of times, that means that the time between the Prophet and the Day of Judgment has to be less than the time between the Prophet and Adam. You see what I mean? So, we don't know, ex so that's the Prophet. So, Imam al-Mahdi is, is, you know, say another, another, you know, 1400, however long, could be 1500 years later, or even more. The, the longer the, the reappearance, you know, the longer we, the longer this ghaybah extends, it seems that the shorter the time, uh, of the uh, of that shukuma, so it's definitely not going to be in in the uh, in the thousands of years. It doesn't seem like it. It seems that it could be. Again, we have conflicting narrations. We don't know. Some have said seventy, so others have said in the hundreds. Allahu Akbar. But it's it's definitely not going to be, you know, something that is extremely uh, lengthy. Okay. And in verse uh, 101, uh, where, it, where it says, um, those from whom, like, have good from us has gone forth, um, could you clarify the meaning of good from us? Uh, is it just talking about revelation, or is it more general than that? So, it could mean, and the, the tafsir, the commentator's, don't really go into much detail, but it it could be Allah's mercy, His guidance, His grace. You know, even our ability to do good, right? Our ability to do good and Allah's reward for our goodness is all from Him. 
So surely those for whom what is most beautiful has already been has already gone forth from us. It's 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 the idea that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala rewards for the good that we do, and He rewards us multiple fold for what we do, and this is something that has been sent forth. You know, that's why in the Quran in Surah Yasin, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says you know He speaks about uh, Inna nahnu nuhyi al-mawta wa naktubu ma qaddamu wa atharhum that we record what they send forward. And what they leave behind. So what we send forward is the, is our deeds, the consequences of our deeds. And it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who preserves this for us. And, you know, this husna could be the, the, the divine reward that has been prepared, uh, uh, in the hereafter that exists now, but it exists in that, in those higher realms. So husna could be the, the, the guidance, the mercy, the reward, any of those things.